Welcome everybody to our fourth organization of biological field stations, OBFS, live from the field event. Thank you for showing where you're coming from and signing in today. My name is Carrie Winninger with Sonoma State University's Center for Environmental Inquiry. We encourage you to take a look at the other three events we have coming up this spring on remote sensing of biodiversity, carbon storage and cycling, and impacts of field research on society. You can learn more at thevirtualfield.org. For those of you who are instructors, be sure to visit thevirtualfield.org to access supplementary materials for your students, such as an instructor guide for Live from the Field events with suggested assignments, and event resources document full of publications about the specific research topics and projects being discussed today. Very quickly, here are some guidelines for this webinar. Remember, all panelists are muted and your video camera, all participants are muted and your video cameras are off. During the presentation, please use the chat button like you are to communicate with us and each other. And remember to choose all panelists and attendees so that everyone will see your comments. During the presentations and the live Q&A session with researchers, please submit your questions using the Q&A button, not the chat. <laughs> If you're here as part of a college class, please type the word student in front of your question so we can prioritize it. And it's important to make sure your full name is, is visible, either as your Zoom username or typed in after the word student so you can receive credit for attending. Also, welcome if you're watching us streaming live on Facebook. If you want to ask a question, you can still register to join the webinar at the link provided. Without further ado, I will turn this over to Danielle Begley Miller, Director of Science and Stewardship, T-Town Lake Reservation in New York, which is a 1,000 acre nature preserve with 15 miles of hiking trails. She's been working in ecology for 10 years and studies the effects of white-tailed deer on forested ecosystems, focusing on improving biodiversity and wildlife habitat in the lower Hudson Valley. Danielle loves that her job gets her outside and doing something different every single day. and. It allows her to make informed decisions based on data and research. Thank you, Danielle. Thanks, Carrie. So um, I wanna thank everyone for joining live from the field. Uh, we welcome classes, faculty, and other participants from across the nation and around the world. So welcome everybody. This is the fourth live from the field event. In this series, we will take you on virtual field trips to research sites around the country and the world. As you'll see today, we are visiting three biological field stations, places where people from many backgrounds come together to study the environment. Live from the field events are a project of the Virtual Field, an international coalition of over 50 field stations and marine laboratories. The National Science Foundation funded effort brings the field to you. Find out more about events like this and other virtual learning experiences for college students at thevirtualfield.org. Today, we are traveling from the Hudson Highlands in New York to the Kansas Plains, and ending our journey in South Africa at Kruger National Park. Each field station represents a unique ecosystem where herbivores have a variety of different effects on other trophic levels in that system. Herbivore ecology is amazing because it encompasses so many other fields of study, botany, soil science, microbiology, human wildlife conflicts, predator ecology, and conservation, just to name a few. I've studied white-tailed deer impacts in the United States for more than a decade now, and each project that I've worked on has focused on different aspects of ecology. I became interested in plant herbivore interactions during my undergrad when I learned how much agricultural um, like uh, corn fields were lost to deer browsing. Um, that was in the Midwest. From there, I moved to studying browsing in temperate deciduous forests and have worked in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and New York. Traveling and living in different parts of the country has sparked my avid interest in the outdoors. I consider myself a naturalist. I love hiking and identifying as many living things as possible using field guides in my time outside, probably because I've spent so much time thinking about how all these parts of an ecosystem interact to shape the world we live in. Uh, learning all, parts, all the parts and pieces of that puzzle is really fascinating to me, and I'm excited to moderate the session of Live from the Field and introduce you to some incredible researchers from all over the world. Each researcher has prepared an eight minute video describing their research on herbivores and their role in local ecosystems. Um, after the videos, the researchers will be available to answer your questions live. I'd like to encourage everyone to post your questions in the Q&A as we go along. Students, remember to type student and your full name in front of your question. 
Um, so we're going to start with Black Rock Forest. Black Rock Forest is a 3,920 acre living laboratory for field-based research and education. It encompasses native terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems in the Hudson Highlands region of New York State. The forest features dramatic topography, more than 1,000 feet of relief, numerous lakes and streams, and high species and habitat diversity. The researcher you're, you'll hear from first is Aaron Collada, who is an environmental educator and visitor services coordinator. He's been working at Black Rock Forest for three years, and he will be talking to you today about how white-tailed deer impact forest habitats. One of his favorite parts about doing field research is that it gets him out of the woods doing what he loves to do. My name is Aaron Collada. I'm an environmental educator here at Black Rock Forest in Cornwall, New York. I have a bachelor's in wildlife management from SUNY Cobleskill, and I work in a variety of different disciplines here at the forest. Uh, somebody who I looked up to a lot as a kid was my grandfather, and I spent a lot of time outdoors with him, and that really piqued my interest in wildlife and how each different species plays into the ecosystem. And from there, I really got got involved with different volunteer opportunities and, and different things going on in the community. So my day-to-day -day job duties here at Black Rock really vary quite a bit. One day I might be out in the field working with a group of students sampling for macroinvertebrates and the next day I might be in the office helping with some event planning or working on communications from social media. So deer are the largest herbivores here at Black Rock Forest and their impacts can alter forest health for seedling regeneration, species composition, and they may also alter the habitat suitability for other species like birds and small mammals. So here at Black Rock Forest, we use a combination of pellet count surveys, winter tracking efforts, and harvest data to get an estimate of our deer densities. In addition to the deer themselves, we also have over 20 different deer exposures, which allow us to compare seedling regeneration from both inside the areas where deer are not allowed and outside where the normal amount of browsing is gonna occur. So here we have a, a deer bed under a hemlock tree. Um, you can see the depression in the snow, how it's all kind of melted and smoothed out. There's also some dropping and a telltale sign that a deer was laying here is some hair. And you can see towards the follicle, it's darker. And then out towards the tip of the hair, it's almost completely white, so it's probably from uh, either the belly or the brisket area of the deer. And there's quite a bit of it in this bed. We probably spent a good amount of time here. Um, we also collect data on acorn production each fall. And acorns make up a large portion of the deer's diet. And over time, we can compare our deer populations and our acorn production for each fall, which allows us to look at projection for the following years. Here at Black Rock Forest, one of our key findings is that our deer populations and deer densities not only vary from year to year, but they vary from season to season. And this is directly related to major weather events and our acorn and food production. So this year, in 2020, we had little to no acorn production, and this resulted in a very low number of deer using the forest and the deer that are currently using the forest have resorted to eating lesser preferred food sources like mountain laurel, hemlocks, and spruces. So some of our other questions include, how has the growing population of coyotes here in the Hudson Valley impacted our deer populations? And over the past 20 years, we've looked at winter kill rates, how many fawns are being depredated by coyotes, and the estimated number of coyotes that we have using the forest here today. The need to study deer here in Black Rock Forest derived from the active forest management practices that have gone on for over 100 years. With deer being the largest herbivores on the ecosystem, they've been of serious concern in regards to forest timber production and forest health overall. So research usually doesn't have a start and an end point. It consists of a series of progression, obstacles, and getting around those obstacles, and then reevaluating where you're at in regards to both your goals and your objectives. And the same thing goes for the deer management program here at Black Rock Forest. We're constantly reevaluating to see where we're at, but also staying consistent over time as deer management will most likely be a part of Black Rock Forest for the foreseeable future.
So one of the biggest challenges we face each year is how weather might impact our sampling efforts. This year we've had over 50 inches of snow in the month of February alone, and that makes it really difficult to get out and do those winter tracking efforts. And we can't go out and sample for our pellet count surveys until all of this snow has melted and we have a bare forest floor. So all of those things may impact how accurate our results are in our tests. We also have a lot of help from volunteers, citizen scientists, and other partners that help out at every step of the way, and whether that's in regards to our pellet counts, or our winter tracking, or our hunter participation in regards to our deer management. We need help from other people to get this done, and that's not always consistent from year to year. So that's really what our biggest challenge has been throughout the past 30 or 40 years here at Black Rock Forest. So for anyone that's looking to get involved in either some kind of deer research or just research in general, I really recommend reaching out to some local nature centers or local organizations. Um, you might not have a place just like Black Rock Forest local to you, but reach out to some universities and see if there are some people in your area that are doing some citizen science projects, and that would be a great opportunity for you to get involved and volunteer your time. And it's always a great opportunity to experience new things and experience new people that you wouldn't have normally met if you hadn't reached out. Um, so next we have Kanza Prairie Biological Station, which is dedicated to a threefold mission of long-term ecological research, education, and prairie conservation, and is open to scientists and students from throughout the world. It encompasses 3,500 hectares of native tall grass prairie in the Flint Hills of Kansas in the central United States. The researcher we're going to hear from is Lydia Zeglin. Dr. Zeglin is an associate professor at Kansas State University who has been working at Kanza Prairie for six years. One of her favorite things about field research is how exciting it is to keep learning. She believes that seeing the whole ecosystem through field research brings an important perspective. Also coming to us from Kanza Prairie is Nico Vega Aguiano. Um, he's a master's of science student in biology at Kansas State University who has been working at Kanza Prairie for two years. Nico likes how the interconnection with the land through field research provides balance to himself and his work. We are so pleased both of them can join us today to tell us about their research on herbivore impacts on soil microbial nitrogen cycling. Great, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Kanza Prairie Biological Station in the heart of the remnant tall grass prairie, Flint Hills of Kansas. We're here in Northeast Kansas. So the Biological Station has been here since the 1970s as a experimental setup that we use to understand the, the factors that support the whole prairie ecosystem. About a hundred years ago, well before the scientists came here. This was a working ranch with cattle. And a hundred years before that, maybe 200 years ago, there were no fences and there was no highway. There was a lot of bison, deer, antelope, elk, rabbits, all sorts of other little critters, grasshoppers, many herbivores that interacted with the plants and the soil and the microbes to support the whole ecosystem. Unfortunately, uh, as European American settlers came through, um, they almost completely exterminated the bison, um, kind of brought their numbers down to closer to a few thousand animals across the Great Plains. And the Native Americans who lived here, the Ka people or the Kanza people who gave the the place its name um, were also kind of moved out or displaced to make room for uh, for what we have here today. So the dominant mega herbivores, the bison, these ungulates here, were reintroduced to the biological station in the 90s. You can see they're behind these fences now because as scientists we want to understand how the bison affects the grassland. So as a control, we need some area of grassland that still doesn't have herbivory. 
what the researchers in the 90s learned about the bison's keystone effect on the prairie. Some of it you can see very clearly with the naked eye. You can see how the tall grasses that characterize the grassland are, dominate the community where there's no bison, but where there are bison grazing, there's less shading by the grasses of the forbs, the, the flowers and the, uh, the sumac there that give the prairie its characteristic high floristic diversity. So the bison are really important just in maintaining the plant communities of the prairie. They also affect the landscape or the soil. They wallow both as sort of a bath and as a, um, they use the wallows as a water source when it's dry over the summer. And those depressions create the heterogeneity in the landscape that also helps support different types of plants. So we have researchers here working on that. You will also be able to see how the bison, after they eat the grass, with the help of the microbes in their guts, <laughs> digest the plants and recycle the nutrients from the plants into the soil, which actually helps the plants grow. So there's a positive feedback between the bison and the plants and the soil microbes and the soil fertility. <laughs> My name is Lydia Zeglin. I'm an associate professor at Kansas State University. I'm an ecosystem ecologist and a microbial ecologist. So that means I study, and with my lab, we study how the elements, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, the nutrients that support all of life move through the ecosystem. And most specifically, we, we study how the bacteria and the fungi, the, the microorganisms that live in the soil, help those nutrients move. And one of the first questions we were interested in is how the diversity of the microorganisms below the ground more than meets the eye, how those microorganisms responded to grazing and fire, the two forces that support the prairie. Um, in order to do these studies, we collect soil cores. We actually bring the soil back to our lab and extract DNA and sequence it, because for bacteria and fungi, to make a species list, you can't just look at the ground like Bess was doing earlier. We have to use DNA. Um, but one of the most interesting things we've learned is that the grazing actually affects the diversity and composition of the soil microbiome much more than fire. You can see behind me how much the fire affects the plant community. <laughs> However, if we could kind of flip this whole view upside down, we would see a very different landscape below ground in the grazed area versus the ungrazed area. And these two uh, trees where there's no, no fire and burned areas would look much, much more similar to the microorganisms. And that does have implications for the way the plants grow that we are studying further. My name is Nicolas Vegangiano and I'm currently a graduate student at Dr. Lydia Zeckman's lab. In 2019, I completed an REU here. What I did was I looked at burned, unburned, grazed, and ungrazed watersheds here on the Kansas Prairie. And we were looking really at the microbes. The focus was really looking at what is this symbiosis and what happens to the symbiosis on land that is managed or unmanaged. And so what we ended up finding is that management with fire and grazing did have an effect on these microbes. However, the strongest effect was grazing. And so what my research is now is really it's going to see how much more can grazing affect these microbes as well as um, the soil fertility. Because without soil fertility, we wouldn't have a landscape that looks like this. People in our family have these indigenous roots and you know have a, a you know a history with the land for thousands of years, time immemorial. My grandfather and, and um, on both, both grand, sets of grandparents when they came here to the United States, one thing I always noticed is they always had gardens. And so the way I came into science, you know, with this AP environmental science class, I was like, oh, 
you know, we talk about like you know soil and like plants. And I was like, oh, I'm a gardener. You know, I've had a garden in my entire life, and you know that's where we grow our food, um, some of our food. And I ended up taking a AP Environmental Science course, and at first I didn't like it at all, not one bit. You know, it's just like having that perspective, and then coming into that high school class, and then eventually ending up liking that high school class. I was able to see, you know, kind of more of these these interconnections between my, the culture that I have and I carry with me. I know a lot of kind of what science is doing now. If I could tell somebody who wants to be a scientist, uh, or give them a piece of advice, I think the biggest piece of advice is persevere. Um, if you feel like you're not cut out for something, but you're passionate about it, and you like it, then keep on doing it, regardless of what anybody tells you. And you should keep doing it, because if you're passionate about something like that, eventually you're gonna get good at it, and eventually you're gonna succeed. So I think that's my, my advice to you. Next up, we have the uh, Skakuza Science Leadership Initiative, SSLI. The campus is located in the semi-arid savanna regions of Southern Kruger National Park, a 2 million hectare reserve in South Africa. It focuses on research, education, and human capital development in savanna ecology and conservation. And the researcher we're going to hear from is Dr. Lawrence Kruger. He has a PhD in botany and is the director of curriculum and the director of African programs with the Organization for Tropical Studies. He's been working in ecology for 26 years and at the SSLI campus for 18 years. His research covers disturbance ecology, plant traits, and open ecosystems. A few things about field research that he likes are understanding ecological dynamics, field data collection, contributing to human capital development in South Africa, Today, he'll be focusing on the extent and consequence of herbivory in African savannas. Good morning, everybody. My name is Lawrence Kruger. I'm the director of the Organization for Tropical Studies South Africa programs. I have been a, a lecturer and a, a, a field mentor for uh, students that have attended the program for the last 18 years. I did my PhD at the University of Cape Town in forest and savanna ecology, and I'm particularly interested in disturbance ecology, how fire and herbivory, whether it be mega herbivores, right down to insects, might influence vegetation dynamics. So I've been incredibly fortunate. My, I'm actually sixth generation botanist, um, so I come from a long line of forest ecologists. But I've been very fortunate in, in my career so far. I've, I've been able to work with some incredible mentors, both at the University of Cape Town and then more lately here in the Kruger Park. But probably the most important experience that I've had to, that really set me on this path was um, working in Bolivia some, oh, some 20 odd years ago. I worked with a group of young biologists who were engaged in uh, um, inventory work in the remote parts of Bolivia and uh, given their four years of work it, it resulted in the establishment of the Madidi National Park and just to see these youngsters um, completely uh, in control of their own destiny um, they'd found their own money they'd figured out how to make a contribution and it was a very liberating experience but also a kind of real epiphany where I realized that this realm is actually relatively easy to engage in and I think that was probably one of the most formative experiences that I've had, aside from all those incredible mentors. A typical day for us is broad and varied. So obviously the study abroad, um, you know, might, we might be engaging in field lectures, uh, running workshops, uh, biodiversity training uh, workshops. But a large component of what we do is also engage in, in management-driven research. So on any, on any course, we probably spend about 50% of our time in the field which is why I took the job in the first place. And the idea is that as we as we um, providing the students with exposure and experience and so on, we're also collecting long-term data sets. So 
Um, when we are in the field, we up at dawn to do bird surveys. We might have put out some uh, small mammal traps and then we go and check those and then do a full day of, of botanical surveys. So during the semester, it's incredibly broad and varied. But in our winter, your summer, um, we also run a range of research campaigns. And the project I'm going to tell you about today uh, forms a basis for, for, for one of those campaigns. The key question that we're focusing on here is how disturbance in the form of mega herbivores and fire might influence these ecosystems. A lot of our work is driven by management needs. So this link between uh, the research which you're doing and the management actions is, is critically important. So how this project is structured, we selected um, 37 sites initially to cover a range in vegetation structure from very open sites to, in this case, relatively treed sites. But we're also comparing to sites in Eswatini, which are heavily wooded. So we've got this a broad range of large tree density. And so we can, we can enumerate uh, the change in, in vegetation density and what are the consequences for, for resin faunal communities. So if we see a significant change in the overstory structure, what are the trophic cascade consequences for resident communities? We have enumerated uh, the floristic communities, the vegetation structure, but we're also interested in the biodiversity consequence of, of, of the structure change. And so we've also engaged in uh, understanding how the bird communities, the small mammals, the meso mammals, and the, the bat communities have changed with this, with this very dynamic uh, shift in the vegetation structure. At the same time though, uh, we're also interested in establishing experiments. So uh, about two years ago, we built a range of experimental fences to exclude herbivores at various scales. So we set up three uh, large or uh, full exclosures, which keeps out all, all mammals, or all animals uh, small, uh, larger than a rabbit. And we've also set up six partial exclosures, which keeps out only mega herbivores, uh, just to start experimenting a little bit with the effects of these various herbivore guilds. And so since 2013, we've done exactly the same thing um, every winter and every summer across these 37 sites, but also the 54 sites in Eswatini. One of the key results to emerge so far is that when comparing the, the sites in the Kruger Park with those in Swaziland, and otherwise the very open sites, the very dense sites, we certainly are seeing a change in diversity, in functional diversity, uh, uh, with the change in vegetation structure. And what we're seeing is in these very open systems is a decline in heterogeneity, whereas in Eswatini, uh, those ecosystems are a lot more heterogeneous. And with the increase in the heterogeneity, we tend to see a greater diversity, not only of species, but also functional diversity. What you're now curious about is, is how these ecosystems recover. So we essentially we're experimenting with savannas. By erecting these fences now, we can, we can determine how vegetation structure might recover. And so the whole slew of questions that come after. Uh, the one that's particularly uh, prevalent in my mind right now is if you're keeping herbivores out, how are these, uh, particularly the woody uh, communities, how are they regenerating and recovering? So I'm interested in the mechanism of recovery and then again, what the trophic cascades might look like. You'll find in all your careers that collaboration is everything. And uh, we encountered uh, um, a group of scientists from the University of Florida that were doing pretty much the same kind of work as we were doing here, but in Swaziland. So they were interested in bush encroachment. We were interested in the impact of elephants and, and fire on ecosystems with combined forces. And suddenly we've got this fabulous platform for experimenting and understanding savanna dynamics. Both of us had arrived in the same set of methodologies in our own uh, messy fashion. And so science is simply not linear. You know, it's not as if you can uh, come up with a series of questions and come up with ideal methodologies. We stumbled a lot and we also argued a lot. Uh, but eventually we got to the point where we'd agreed on a, on a, a standard ses a set of methodologies and so we could carry out the work and rendering our work in the Kruger Park comparable to Swaziland, but also rendering comparable to a whole bunch of other global work. So this collaboration between ourselves, OTS, uh, the University of Florida, and uh, members of scientific services here in Skukuza is called the Browse Project, the Biodiversity Research on Wildlife and Savannah Ecosystems, led by Bob McClear at University of Florida, 
uh, Donovan Tyne, myself at OTS, and Corley Kutsir at Sand Parks, as well as other partners uh, uh, from the University of Eswatini. Now, as you can imagine, this is a great platform for students to come and work. So whilst we focus on the fundamentals, there are all kinds of other questions that, that have emerged. So one, for instance, we have a, a PhD student um, looking at uh, the landscape of fear and how that might change with vegetation structure. So there are any number of opportunities that might emerge from this project. Um, uh, senior theses, MSCs, PhDs, postdocs. W we simply can't cover all the bases. So whilst we're doing the fundamental uh, work and engaging the, the, the key questions, there's so many other questions that are emerging. All right, so now is time for the panel discussion and Q&A. Please post questions for the researchers using the Q&A button rather than the chat. Um, our college classes have a time constraint of 50 minutes, so we're initially going to give priority to their questions. After that, we will answer questions from other attendees until the top of the hour. As a reminder, students, please type the word student before your question and make sure that your full name is visible. The panelists are going to try to keep their answers to a minute or less so that we can get to as many of these great questions as possible. To get us all started, um, I'd like to hear from all of the panelists. So I'm going to ask to have you briefly answer this question. We'll start with Lawrence Kruger, then Lydia Zeglin, followed by Nico, Nico Vega Anguiano, and ending with Aaron Collada. Remind us, what drew you to herbivore research in the first place? So the fun part about savannas is that they're incredibly dynamic um, and as, in, as an open ecosystem, it's, um, it, it can change dramatically over short um, spatial scales and, and short temporal scales. And a great deal of attention has been focused on fire, uh, but of late we've really realized that um, a broad uh, diversity of herbivores can have e an equal effect to, to that of fire. So I think to ignore the effects of herbivorian savannas would be very foolish. Um, and also it's very quirky and interesting. I agree. And I think I'm next. Um, yeah, honestly, I, I study herbivores because I grew up on a farm with sheep and cattle and a, a few little native grasses kind of peeking out in one of the unimproved pastures and always kind of imagined or wanted to know what uh, what the grassland looked like with, you know, the original herbivores and, and grasses there. Um, so it's been pretty exciting to actually have a job that, that allows me to think about that more. Um, that's the answer. I think for me, it was uh, having the opportunity to work with bison. Um, bison have been around for such a long time, for thousands of years on the landscape, and being able to study them and um, understand their interconnectedness with the landscape and balance in the landscape has been a great opportunity for me. And um, kind of uh, on the other end of the spectrum, where I grew up, we didn't have a lot of uh, prairies and farmlands, um, but I spent a lot of time watching uh, wildlife as a kid um, and herbivores in particular. Um, and as I kind of made my way through college, I figured out that I can actually study this and um, this could be a part of my daily job. So um, I just kind of followed those, uh, those ahead of me and I ended up working at a place where I get to study deer, which is something that I love to do. Thank you for those insights. I'd like to follow Carrie's question with another for each of you to answer. Um, during the time that you have worked at your research site, have you observed impacts of a changing climate? And if so, what are a few observations that you've made about how your local site is changing and how do herbivores fit into that? Let's start with Lydia, and then Nico, then Aaron, and Lawrence. Great. Yeah, I've been here six years, and even in that time, it's, it's very clear that the amount of rain every year has a big impact on how, how tall the grasses really are. So like in a wet year, they'll be as tall as me, for real, and in a dry year, maybe up to my knee. Um, so the increase in drought prevalence and the, the, the decrease in predictability 
in how much rainfall will happen um, really impacts the entire grassland and of course how much food there is for the herbivores to eat. Um, so yes, there's a definite impact of climate change that we can observe. Yeah, I definitely agree. And I've worked in Kansas for a bit. And one thing I noticed while being here, especially in Manhattan, Kansas, is recently we had a very, very horrible cold snap. And um, it probably was maybe one of the coldest, if not the coldest times um, here in, in, in recent history. And uh, in regard to how they affect herbivores, I was really concerned about bison. And I was like, oh man, like, are they gonna freeze? It was like negative 15. And I started reading a bit more and I was like, well, they have amazing thermal regulation uh, properties and they're very hardy and very tough. And so, you know, knowing that the climate is changing and knowing that these animals are very resilient, um, you know, provides, is gonna provide a lot of insights on how we can, how we can uh, make this landscape um, more resilient, I think. So, although um, I've only been at Black Rock for three years. I've lived in the Hudson Valley for my entire life. So over 20, almost 25 years now. And um, one of the things that always uh, stands out is how our, our fall and how our winter weather impact um, not just deer, but our other herbivore populations as well. And kind of like I touched on in the video, we had super low um, acorn production this year. And we just so happen to have a really harsh winter. So um, those deer are definitely browsing heavily on um, less than ideal species, which kind of hurts some of um, the forest composition and are really important species that are already hurting like the hemlocks uh, due to hemlock folia delgid. So something as simple as climate can kind of impact those other species. So um, in, in the Southern African savannas, we, I guess the two key features for me, the first is that we, we are seeing shifts in uh, climatic patterns. We're not seeing the distinctive La Nino El Nino cycles. Um, we're starting to get in, certainly in the wet cycles, we're starting to see our rain come later and later. Um, and the weather events are more extreme. So we, the drought we've had recently was uh, the worst in recorded history. And certainly the, we're seeing uh, a far greater increase in, the, um, in some of the, the floods as well. Uh, the second is that um, life of a woody plant in savannas is particularly rough. You've got to deal with fire, you've got to deal with competition from grasses, and usually it's in the drought periods that the woody plants can kind of escape this, this um, both the fire and the herbivory trap. And a student of mine has just been looking at the climate change effect, so to uh, um, disentangle the effects of climate change from very messy, messy savanna dynamics is quite difficult. But certainly we're seeing a decline in the recruitment of many woody plant species, not only a decline in number, but also a, uh, a complete shift in the spatial distribution of the adults versus the, the seedlings. So some fairly significant impacts. Thank you all for those answers. Our next question goes to Nico Vega Anguiano. Uh, are the European grasses now gone? And if so, how did you get rid of them to restore native grasses? That's an interesting question. Um, so I'm gonna clarify a little bit. Um, so I was working mainly in uh, dominant tall grass prairie. So dominant tall grass prairie includes a lot of the native grasses that have been here for a long time um, in the tall grass prairie region. Um, I didn't really focus on European invasive species at all. Um, so I didn't get rid of anything. Um, what I was looking at was how uh, bison and specifically land management like fire um, affected uh, how uh, arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi um, and the way they were kind of distributed across the landscape. You know, if they were more affected by the plants and if they held them more in their symbiosis or um, did land management have a bigger factor and it turns out that land management did. Um, mainly with, with grazing um, interactions by bison. I didn't look at cattle, but I did look at bison. So I hope that clarifies your question a bit, um, but thank you for the Okay, the next question is for Lydia. Um, 
the, a student was wondering if researchers uh, in your study site had studied the differences between buffalo grazing, cattle grazing, and what they call beefalo grazing, um, and what the differences were, if they did that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we, we, I don't know anything about the beefalo as a comparison. That's sort of the hybrid between the two. Um, but we do have some, some, more, some data from the 90s and actually what the new project that Nico is working on now that we don't have data for yet on both the um, plant composition effects of cattle versus bison and then the soil effects. Um, the cattle herbivory effects are similar in mechanism to bison where they prefer to eat grass graminoids and that will allow more of the forbs and the other flowers to sort of proliferate in the open spaces. Um, so from that perspective, they are similar, but bison and cattle behave differently. Like Nico mentioned, they, the cattle are not quite so tough when the weather gets bad. So they actually have um, differential impacts on the streams um, uh, a little bit more so than the, the grasses in, in particular. And we'll tell you more about the soil effects in a, in a year or two. <laughs> it's a really good question. Great. So the next question is going to Aaron Kulata. And this question is first saying, you seem to be learning the positive value of native herbivores in systems. So now what about um, folks that say who, who say that cows are just as good if the bison, deer, and elephants are gone? So it's kind of a, a follow up there. Karen, could you just repeat that question again? If like... Sure, yes. Yeah. So this person is saying, what about folks who say cows are just as good if the bison, deer, and elephants are gone? Um, I'm not really sure, to be completely honest. I don't know too much about the, how bison and cattle and all those other species would um, impact some place similar to Black Rock, although at one point in time, Pretty much all of Black Rock Forest in the Hudson Highlands was cleared and there were pastures here. Um, so one thing to keep in mind is that um, probably about 100 years ago, um, there were um, people who were kind of forcing a farmland and pasture landscape on the, uh, on the land here today. Um, so as deer populations were kind of eliminated um, and then brought back after um, these forestry practices uh, took place, you were kind of 100 years past that. So we've seen that, um, you know, our grazers might not be bison or, or buffalo or uh, cattle anymore. They're, they're deer, but they have pretty much the same impact, um, especially being that, you know, the average deer could maybe be, you know, eat about four to eight pounds of browse a day. And then on top of that, three to five acorns a day, uh, pounds of acorns a day. So. They definitely have similar impacts, even though they might not be the same size. Yeah, and I'd like to follow up here um, since Aaron and I work in similar uh, systems. So the difference between cattle and uh, and your native herbivores, um, cattle are not selective at all for what they eat. There are very few species that they do not eat, and they're considered true grazers. They basically mow down vegetation throughout um, the area that they're in. Whereas white-tailed deer, for example, are browsers. So they are very selective in the food that they eat and they have a hierarchy of preference. So if they have something they really, really want, they'll eat that first and then they'll pick through the stuff that's left over. Um, you can think of it like, um, you know, if you're at a buffet and they offer you, you know, uh, jello or like a super nice dessert, you're probably gonna eat the nice dessert first, but if only jello is available and you want something sweet, you would pick that instead. So um, that's the way that I would describe it. And again, every system's different. So you have to think about how, um, you know, in prairies, right, that's a very different ecosystem type than forests. So the herbivores are functioning very differently in both of those situations. If I may, there's a really good paper that came out of um, South Africa recently by Gareth Hampson, uh, where he defined well, we all know about uh, plant biomes, but he defined herbivomes. And uh, essentially the message is that you get this enormous range in herbivore gills. Um, and so just to follow on, um, uh, if, if cattle end up dominating a system, they're, they're very homogenous in their effect. Whereas um, if the native species um, remain in the system, 
the effects are somewhat heterogeneous. Uh, the last is that mega herbivores are a special category unto themselves, where they are you know, very much ecosystem engineers, which is pretty important for some of the savanna dynamics. So um, certainly cattle can uh, mimic some of the effects of, of indigenous species, but really the effects of indigenous herbivores are, are far broader. Um, and so it would be difficult to, to manage the system just with cattle, although some great work done by Alan Savory and worth looking at that as well. Okay, so um, I wanna thank everybody, that all the students that have attended. If you need to leave now, um, we'll be emailing follow-up information for other attendees. The panel will stay on through the top of the hour and continue to answer questions. I just wanna get the plug in for students. All right, so the next question um, is for uh, Lawrence. So are you working with any indigenous people or communities in South Africa in regards to their traditional knowledge of grassland and herbivore dynamics and how have they managed those ecosystems in the past? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so South Africa, we have a pretty strong history of including indigenous knowledge in understanding our ecosystems. Um, and so certainly when it comes to grazing practices or, or the management of our of savannas and grasslands, um, that has been a focus on our work. Although the original peoples in um, um, uh, the very first peoples would have been the sand bushmen who weren't pastoralists, they were hunter gatherers. So of course, that's a that's a whole new realm. Um, but yes, now we do include um, uh, um, indigenous knowledge in much of our discussions and certainly a great asset test for any of your ecological thinking is to ask a local expert. So if once you have you think you've figured out what's happening in the Kruger Park, the best thing to do is step outside the Kruger Park and have a word with some of the uh, pastoralists outside and you'll very quickly realize whether you know what you're talking about or not. And so, um, yes, no, the, the relationship is tight and, and, and clear. Plenty of debates and discussions, obviously, and, and disagreements. But yes, no, you've, you've, got, to, you've, you've got to incorporate all um, sources of knowledge for sure. Thank you. This one goes to both Nico and Lydia. Uh, and Rich says, I saw in your presentation the trampled vegetation of the bison plots compared to the tall grass on the non-bison plot. Do the bison plots get lush and grassy in a unique way once the bison rotate elsewhere? I'm thinking about the holistic management type stuff. Grasslands depend on herbivory, yes? Sure, yeah, I'll start. Um, and I can tie this back to a follow up with, with uh, Lawrence's question as well, because, you know, um, at, again, as, as the scientists and as the experiment station that we, you know, work at, we have very clearly delineated little experimental units. And that allows us to understand and pinpoint that the, some mechanism is related to bison or fire or the interaction between the two. But in, in reality and in you know, historical indigenous management sort of perspectives, the, there would not be such a clearly delineated sort of um, situation. So, so the heterogeneity, the patchiness that would have existed in the past would have been a lot more complex. Um, and, um, and, and yes, I think the direct answer to your question is I would expect, especially with, you know, the, the, the positive feedback of the fertilization of the animals moving through larger areas of the landscape um, that very clearly promotes more production of grasses and other plants um, when the animals aren't there. So that's the shortest answer I can give you. It's a good point, thanks. Okay, the next question we have is for Aaron. Uh, one of the things that makes herbivores an interesting area of study is how they interact with other parts of an ecosystem. Can you share a little bit about some of the ways that deer make managing northeastern ecosystems challenging? So, yeah, the kind of funny, a lot of this has to do with what you were just talking about earlier when you helped out. Um, the selective browsing that goes on, especially um, in deer, uh, altering both uh, you know, the existing community and then, you know, inadvertently promoting invasives in our region. Um, there's a lot of forests that have virtually no understory and um, that creates a perfect stage for invasives like Japanese barberry and uh, still grass to come in and kind of invade those, those areas. 
so uh, you know, indirectly they're impacting uh, other species and other uh, habitat types and ecosystems. Thank you. One question for Lawrence Kruger. South Africa represents a very different landscape from most of North America and hosts uh, may host many species of herbivores. How does studying landscapes with multiple large herbivores affect how you design experiments to separate their effects? Oh, interesting question. So, um, you know, obviously you've got, you've got to take into account um, uh, the, the gills that you have in your, your systems here. So just practically our fences are built um, incredibly well because they've got to deal with elephants and, and um, other mega herbivores. But I guess it just depends on your, the, the question you're trying to answer. Um, so from a dynamics perspective, um, you know, your Konza prairies are very much like our grasslands in South Africa. So there are actually some fantastic similar questions there grazing uh, intensity experiments, the exclusion experiments. Um, so it's a bit of a, um, an open and a question in the sense that it just all depends on what you're trying to ask. Um, but I guess just with the effects of mega herbivores in these systems, which you would have had it as well in your, your, your North American systems at one point, um, you, we just got an added layer of complexity and therefore an added layer of, of difficulty when it comes to designing our fences and so on from a practical sense. Um, but actually, the, the questions are pretty similar. So um, there's some great papers um, exploring the, uh, the similarities and the differences um, between um, some of the, the grassland systems in the United States and, and South Africa. Um, I'll do a follow up and a, and a transition too, because we, you know, we struggle with this question um, as well of you know, how to understand all of the pieces at once. It's, it's impossible, <laughs> difficult. <laughs> Um, and actually something that we haven't, uh, we're starting to grapple with a little bit more just in the past couple of years is the interactive effects of the browsers that Danielle and Aaron um, brought up most directly. Uh, you know, there are deer here too, like you saw, and they do affect the seedling regeneration patterns as well. Um, and, and woody encroachment into like the displacement of the grasses by trees is, a, is an um, increasing threat, I guess, to the prairie. So. Um, we, we, we could use advice from Aaron and Danielle, I guess, about exactly how to, how to uh, control the deer in a way, or you know, control our understanding of the deer. Um, so yeah, that's another really good question. The, you know, the trees are so much bigger than grasses and we're not actually even set up to measure trees very well in the first place. So um, yeah, it's interesting. Okay. The question earlier um, was about climate. If I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. Lawrence. We're going to wrap up actually, so we're getting to time. Um, but yeah, I want to thank everybody, Aaron, Lydia, Nico, and Lawrence, um, for for participating in this, um, and thank you to the Organization of Biological Field Stations and the Center for Environmental Inquiry at Sonoma State University. Learn more about their series of virtual events at cei.sonoma.edu. Thank you to the National Science Foundation for funding this project and to all the wonderful people behind the scenes who have made this possible. We will be emailing all of you in the next few days with follow-up answers to questions we didn't address today. There were several of them. Uh, a link to the recording of this event, a link to provide feedback and ideas for future events, what you enjoyed, other event themes you might be interested in seeing in the future, and suggestions for how to improve. Please share the virtualfield.org and our upcoming events with fellow instructors, students, friends, and colleagues. Past event recordings are accessible on the Live from the Field page under Virtual Visits, where you'll also find links to the websites of each site featured today and event resources, including publications for each researcher and educational tools. Um, thank you all and goodbye from the field. We're gonna wave bye to everybody.